mean it's time to start. So good evening. Um, I'm Denise Young, Executive Director of the Bell Museum, and I'm honored that you're here at the Bell this evening for what I'm sure is going to be a wonderful event. The Friends of the Library's Friends Forum Opener, featuring Chef Sean Sherman. Say that five times, really. <laughs> As we begin this evening, it is important to acknowledge that the Bell Museum is located on sacred and treaty land of the Dakota people. With my brief welcome, I'd like to share what an exciting few months has been at the Bell. We opened these doors right here in mid-July, and since then we've welcomed over 70,000 people to the new museum, including over 30,000 people to, to the Whitney and Elizabeth McMillan Planetarium, which is right behind us. Our mission is to ignite curiosity and wonder, explore our connections to nature and the universe, and to create a better future for our revolving world. We live our mission daily through exhibits and programs, K-12 educational efforts, planetarium shows and events, including the Our Global Kitchen, Food, Nature, and Culture exhibit, which hopefully you have an opportunity to enjoy this evening, and through programs like the one tonight. Upon arriving to the University of Minnesota just over two years ago, one of the first people to greet me was Wendy Luger, university librarian and dean of the libraries. Wendy shared that the libraries and the Bell have a lot in common and a long history of working together. Since that, since that conversation, our teams have continued to collaborate through exhibits, public programs, and Wendy, I dare bring it up, through the archivists at the libraries taking on over 140 years worth and 300 boxes worth of important Bell Museum papers, <laughs> photos, and film as we packed up and moved from our previous location to this one earlier in the year. After every interaction, my staff had returned enthusiastic and invigorated and with the utmost respect for the librarians and archivists, and indeed the work of the university libraries. So this evening, as I turn things over to Wendy, I'd like to thank her for her kindness and for the long-standing collaboration between the university libraries and the Bell Museum. take those 300 boxes, but not the dioramas. <laughs> so it's been wonderful to work with the Bell Museum in, in creating tonight's event, um, and I'm so delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Friends of the University Libraries here. And this is our launch event for the year. Um, we have a series called the Friends Forum, a series for curious minds, and this is the first of that season. And while one of wonderful venue in which to have this event. I hope you agree with me about that. Just a spectacular setting. And tonight we are honored to, of course, present Chef Sean Sherman, and I have practiced saying that five times fast. And not good. Uh, entrepreneur and award-winning cookbook author who has made big waves in the uh, world of food. But this evening's event is also the fourth in our Kirshner Lecture Series honoring Doris Kirshner. She had a lifelong interest in cooking, culminating in an extraordinary cookbook collection that she gave to the university. Uh, she collected things about diverse cuisines, about food history, and about the technology of cookery, which we all know if we cook, there is a technology and a science to it, right? And her family donated the collection to the University of Libraries, along with an endowment to support the collection and programs such as this. So I want to uh, give you a little background about the collection by inviting the curator of the Kirshner Cookbook Collection to uh, give us some background. Megan Coker is the curator and also one of our science librarians. Megan? was donated to the University of Minnesota in 1985 by Doris Kirshner, a graduate of the university's home economics department, an avid home cook and cookbook collector. 
Doris planned her family's meals months in advance, and our collection includes decades worth of her meal calendars, rich with detail of interest to layperson and researcher. Uh, Doris Kirshner passed away in 2001, but her family continues to support the cookbook collection, allowing us to acquire new volumes and reach more people. The collection contains cookbooks from the 1800s through the present, and thanks to the generosity of the Kirshners, we are able to purchase each year's new James Beard award-winning cookbooks, as well as cookbooks from local authors and chefs like tonight's speaker, Sean Sherman. The Kirshner Collection also saw huge growth this year from the acquisition of Beatrice Ojekangas' cookbook collection, which comprised nearly 2,000 cookbooks. The Ojekangas books have greatly expanded our baking and Scandinavian cooking sessions, and we now have over 5,600 cookbooks in the collection. Uh, to accommodate this growth, uh, the collection has expanded its physical footprint in the McGraw Library as well. In addition to expanding our print holdings, we're working on digitizing items from the collection that are out of copyright. So we did a first round of, a round of digitization, which has yielded around 60 cookbooks that are now available through uh, publicly through the library's online archive called UMedia. The Kirshner Collection is a unique resource in our state that provides materials for historians, researchers, bloggers, and home cooks alike. As you can see from the Our Global Kitchen exhibit here at the Bell, food can tell us a lot about ourselves and our, our society. I invite you all to come visit the Kirshner Collection to reflect on our shared history and maybe to figure out what's for your next meal. <laughs> Keeping a record of what you cook for decades, which is what Doris did. And this is truly a fabulous collection. And folks that are dealing with obesity and nutrition find it a rich resource, as well as those who, of us who just like to cook. So I hope you'll visit the, uh, the collection. So before we get to the main course of this evening, and I'd like to acknowledge several people who are here with us this evening. First, representing the Kirshner family, we have Amy Ulsh. Amy, where are you? Thank you for joining us. And Ford Bell, seated in the front here, whose grandfather, James Ford Bell, uh, provided significant funding for the Bell Museum, but also uh, established the James Ford Bell Library, dealing with the history of trade, international trade, and uh, exploration. So what a wonderful combination tonight of bringing those two, those gifts and legacies together here at the university. And finally, a thank you to our friends in the libraries and the members of the Bell Museum for your generous support. For those who are members, uh, we thank you. If you're not a member, we still have an opportunity to do so, and there's some brochures near the table at the entrance that you can sign up. And now let's talk food. Chef Sean Sherman's career has been amazing and inspirational. He has set a Kickstarter record for individual backers in the restaurant category. He's launched a unique catering company. He's published a James Beard award-winning cookbook and announced a partnership with the Minneapolis Park Board for a new riverfront restaurant. He clearly has a hold on an idea whose his time has come, which is the reclamation and revival of indigenous cuisine and culture. Chef Sherman is an Ogala Lakota, born in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. He's been cooking across the U.S. and Mexico for over 30 years and has become renowned nationally and internationally, especially for this focus on the culinary movement of indigenous foods. His main focus has been on the revitalization and evolution of indigenous food systems throughout North America, and he has studies that studied extensively to determine the foundations of those food systems and to gain a real understanding of how to bring back a sense of Native American cuisine to today's world. In 2014, he opened a sous chef as a caterer and as a food educator here in the Twin Cities. In October last year, to celebrate the release of his new cookbook, he developed and prepared the first decolonized dinner at the James Beard House in Manhattan. And this past April, his cookbook, The Sous Chefs, 
Indigenous Kitchen, co-authored with Beth Dooley, was awarded the James Beard Medal for Best American Cookbook for 2018. And I'm okay. published by the University of Minnesota Press. <laughs> it was also chosen as one of the top 10 cookbooks by the LA Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Smithsonian Magazine. And this year, Chef Sherman was selected as a Bush Fellow, and the sous chef team of 12 continues with their mission to help educate and make indigenous foods more accessible to as many communities as possible through their recently founded nonprofit entitled the North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems. Please give a warm welcome to Chef Sherman. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, um, what a great venue, you know, this is such a cool room, this is my first time in here in the new building, so I'm just really excited to be here, and it was a lot of fun to be able to walk through the Global Kitchen exhibit and uh, see all the cool stuff that they had in there. Um, you guys can hear me fine everywhere? Okay, just always double checking. Um, we're going to talk tonight over a few different things, and we're going to talk about um, why, what we do, why we think it's important. We're going to talk about... Um, kind of what brought us to, to do this kind of work, what we see for the future, and just our, our perspective on looking at food in, in a different way. Um, so um, my slide show started a little bit early, but that's okay, um, because you know, when it comes down to it, um, you know, all of North America's history begins with indigenous history. Um, and what that really meant to me as a chef um, I had grown up on Pine Ridge Reservation, um, which is in South Dakota. Um, Pine Ridge Reservation is one of those kind of places that uh, for us was amazingly beautiful and open and sparse. Um, and we had a great childhood there. You know, we ran around like crazy. Um, it was uh, a, me and a pack of cousins and a few dogs. Um, you know, we were just really curious and explored the countryside a lot. You know, I only had one and a half TV channels growing up, so I really wasn't an option back then in the 70s. And um, it was just a really beautiful place, um, but it's also been plagued with a lot of issues. So it's also a place that has um, a lot of bad statistics when you look at what's going on there. You know, it could have anywhere from 85 to 95 percent unemployment rate today. And if you think about it, that's a lot. You think about the Great Depression that crippled the United States at the beginning of the 1900s. And back then, that was a 24.5 unemployment rate, which was big. So imagine a 95% unemployment rate. And that was kind of the environment that I was growing up in. That's what was happening on Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, even born in the 1970s, I was born in 1974. And that hadn't even been a hundred years since the Lakota had lost the Black Hills at that point in time. So as a chef, um, I didn't know I was going to become a chef. I started working in kitchens out of necessity um, because like a lot of families, um, my mom struggled. She had uh, myself and my sister and I, my parents had split up when I was a little bit younger. She decided to go back to school. So she moved us from the reservation to a small town called Spearfish, South Dakota which is a really beautiful small town in the Black Hills. And growing up in Spearfish um, was an amazing spot to be, um, but you know we didn't have a lot of money growing up, so I had to start working as soon as I could. So first was paper routes, and then I immediately got a restaurant job when I was barely 13. And I started working in restaurants at the age of 13, um, and I just had a good work ethic. You know, I'd grown up on a ranch, and I'd done a lot of work already as a young kid. You know, I'd, been driving since way before it was legal, but <laughs> and also in operating farm machinery uh, on top of that. Um, but you know, it was what it was. That was the that was the seventies number one. I were all a little feral in the seventies, I think. But uh, especially if you're growing up on the reservation, it was a little bit more so. Um, so starting in restaurants, working as a kid, I didn't really see that as a career. It was just a thing that I was doing. Um, and uh, much later in life, you know, looking backwards, I found that I'd always been on this path that kind of led me to where I am today. 
Um, I had pretty much worked restaurants all the way through high school, college, and after college in the Black Hills, I moved to Minneapolis and just started working in restaurants um, around the uptown area. And then pretty much you know, spent a big chunk of my 20s living in that area. Um, I became a chef when I was still pretty young. I didn't really know much about being a chef. I could make food look pretty on a plate so I could make it taste good. Those are two good qualities for a chef. But I didn't know much about uh, managing um, all the feral cats in the back of the house. <laughs> so there's still a lot of um, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, struggles when it comes to running restaurant staff because we all um, you know come from uh, diverse backgrounds and it can be really interesting sometimes of what happens in restaurants. And so, anyways, after a few years of being a chef in the cities. I really had that moment where all of a sudden I realized I had been studying food from all over the world. So I didn't go to cooking school, I just kind of jumped into it and I taught myself by just looking at uh, lots of cookbooks, um, researching and reading a lot, applying these lessons to, to things that I was playing with and doing in the kitchen, um, using some of my money and time to travel and going to Europe and like really thinking about where food comes from, whether I was in France or Italy or England or wherever, I would just really think about where the region I was in, the history of the food, of the wine, everything that was there. So um, I kind of uh, had this epiphany all of a sudden that even in Uptown, you know, vibrant as it was in the, in the mid-2000s, and I could find food from all over the world, and we're all very proud of our food scene, but then I realized that I, because you know I could find food from all over the world, um, I just suddenly saw like where are all of the Native American restaurants? You know, it just didn't really make sense. You know, because we had food from everywhere. I could walk just a few blocks, and then there was just nothing that represented the land that I was standing on, and the history, and the people. Um, and it really shot me on a path to try to understand. So I really shot out to try to understand first off. You know, what were my Lakota ancestors eating? Because I knew that this doesn't go back a long ways in my own personal family history, because I was just looking at the era of my great-grandparents. My great-grandfather, um, he was born on the Lakota Plains and was raised traditional on the plains of the Lakota. And during his lifetime, he sees all of the struggles between the Lakota and the U.S. government, and the eventually, eventually the loss of almost everything that happened with their way of life, right? He sees the loss of Black Hills. He sees the almost complete uh, disappearance of bison happen in just his one lifetime, almost in a decade. Um, he sees his, his children um, going to boarding schools and cutting their hair and being uh, told they cannot speak uh, Lakota at home. You know, um, I, he sees his uh, children eventually grow up and um, start and join the army, you know, join the armed forces for the United States government and start, you know, because like, uh, he just sees all this and that's so much for like, one lifetime to witness um, of a complete decimation of a certain culture um, and to what became today. So my great grandfather, he was 18 during the Battle of Little Bighorn, um, you know, and it's, uh, it's just so interesting for me to think back, but again, this is not ancient history. This is just my great-grandparents' era. It's not that long ago. Um, so when we're talking about the kind of food that we do, we have a lot of these conversations because there's a lot of bad histories that's happened to indigenous peoples. It's a big reason why there aren't Native American restaurants. And to answer that question, we have to talk about why it's important for us to use terms like um, decolonized foods and pre-colonial foods. And what does that even mean? Um, so we just look at, first off, just to get everybody on the same page, first off, like what exactly are pre-colonial foods? Um, to understand that, you really have to understand colonialism. So colonialism is the policy or practice of acquiring full, partial, or political, uh, um, full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically. Um, and we've seen this in history, like, you know, even in our history, we've seen a lot of this happening, and especially a lot of it does come out of Europe, because we see similar instances happening throughout Africa, throughout India, throughout the Middle East, throughout Southeast Asia, throughout Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, both North and South Americas. Um, it's happening on a global scale. But what people don't always realize is, again, how recent this happened to where we are standing here today, right? Because um, Minnesota hasn't even been a state that long, 
And I hate to break it to Minnesotans a lot of time, but there is history before Laura Ingalls out there. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so we look at a map like this and think about when our country was brand new, because we're a very young country. You know, we are, you know, 1776. Um, you know, I was just in Europe um, a couple of times this summer, and, you know, there are, you know, people's houses are older than that, you know. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of history out there. So just to think about like how fast this happens We look at when our country is brand new and this will show you like how fast things disappear for indigenous peoples um, So, you know when our country is brand new over 80% of what is the US is under complete indigenous control Even though France says we've got this section and Spain says we've got this section and Great Britain says we've got this section, you know but it just starts being pushed, and especially right after the Civil War, that's when things go really fast. So between the years mostly of 1840 to 1870 is where a mass amount of trauma happens to a mass amount of people in a very, very short time period. Um, and during this time period, people are being removed, reservation systems are being created, genocide is happening. Um, there's a lot of destruction happening at an ex ex extremely high rate. And it's a, it's a push for this kind of modern colonialism that's happening at that point in time because the U.S. is wanting all of these natural resources that are out there. They want to foresee this manifest destiny of being able to move across the entire West from coast to coast and be able to utilize all of this land space, right? So that's a big piece. And we see the U.S., um, you know, really making it a big part. So um, it's kind of hard to see this a little bit, but this is a poster that happens at Sand Creek. And so this was pushed out in Denver right before the Sand Creek Massacre, and you can read about it. But, you know, people were actively removing indigenous people from their communities. Um, people have been living in some of these areas for a very long time, too. So it's really, um, just to understand history of how fast it is, you have to think about how this was happening. And the U.S. really utilized the destruction of foodways as kind of a tool of warfare that happened. So we see um, them understanding that if they control food, they can control people. If they can, you know, make the, they can uh, just, they, they make their battles easier for them. Because if people are hungry, then they're really worried about what's going to happen next. And they're easier to um, subdue when it comes to that. So we see the mass destruction of crops happening on the East Coast. One of uh, General Washington, or President Washington's first order was sending General Sullivan through to really push and push push out a lot of this indigenous uh, communities that were all over the Northeast. Um, we see the mass destruction of bison, which again happened in almost within 10 years because with all these people coming out and people were just destroying this animal at an extremely high rate. And it was such an important food source for a lot of people out there. Um, we also just see inadvertent things of this colonialist push too because the um, just destroying all of the natural resources. So this is a picture of um, a lumber company in in uh, Deadwood, South Dakota, in the late, in the like 1870s area, um, and just thinking about like how much destruction was done to natural resources. You think about all these old growth forests that were just completely wiped out within that little bit of time frame, and all the damage that that that, that does on a, on an ecosystem, right? Um, and you think about the redwoods where. Today, we only have 10% of the old growth redwoods living today, and that's a constant battle to hold on to those ones because people are always wanting that. The indigenous peoples that live within the redwoods for that stretched on for miles and miles upon the whole west coast, you know, they lived um, with all of, they did all the stuff with the redwoods. They built huge houses that was longer than this room is wide, right? They were able to build huge longboats and all sorts of stuff and never had to cut down a single tree because they knew how to harvest the wood sustainably to live with them. Um, and if we had learned from some of those very simple lessons, we could have had enough of that resource for everybody for generations to come. Or now, you know, we're lucky that we have any of those things left. Um, so thinking about that, and then what really seals the deal for why there aren't indigenous restaurants everywhere, and why this seems like a new concept when it shouldn't be, because no matter where you are in North America, you're standing on indigenous land, you're standing on indigenous history, there's food, there's flavor, there's culture, right, wherever we are, right? So this war on knowledge and this push for assimilation was a big part of what really helped break people from this culture that was decades old. Because you think about indigenous education, of what that really means. 
people, indigenous education, like education didn't have a price tag on it for indigenous peoples. Education was something that we passed down to our children, and they passed down to their children. And it was thousands of generations of education and knowledge being handed down. And it's a wonderful commonality you're going to find in indigenous cultures all around the world, that they have this blueprint to be able to live sustainably within their region, utilizing almost just plants and animals alone, right? So it's just to think about how resourceful they were, no matter where you are, if you're in Southeast Asia, if you're in Africa, if you're in the Americas, people, indigenous communities had over thousands of generations figured out how to utilize what they had right around them. So it's an understanding of everything. So this thousands of years of generational knowledge is very important and it's something that got swallowed up by this colonial push and this kind of uh, Western education model that we've all grown up with, right? So to think about what happened to these, this generation of kids at the turn of the century with the creation of boarding schools and residential schools, um, it was really damaging to our culture because these kids should have been learning about all the stuff that their grandparents and grandparents before them had been teaching. So hunting, fishing, crafting, um, gardening, farming, um, anything like all the language, the songs, the legends, all of their education should have been able to continue, but they were punished for speaking languages. They were punished for dressing in their clothes. Um, and again, like a lot of these kids didn't even make it through that. Um, the creator of the boarding schools in the U.S. You know, was really on this platform to be able to showcase that he could save the Indians, you know, if he was able to turn them into real Americans. Um, um, but really what they were doing was just teaching them trade skills um, and servitude skills. So, you know, we look at uh, how many of them popped up all around the U.S. and heavy concentrations of areas like where I grew up, around the Dakotas, or you see it around the Southwest, or around California. Um, you see it up in Canada, which was just as awful, because these boarding schools were still alive up until the 1990s, right? Uh, my mother went to a boarding school. Um, a lot of people from indigenous communities have family members that have gone through the boarding school system, and there are a lot of bad memories that happened there. Because, again, these kids, um, you know, they sh should have been carrying on their culture. And so it's been a struggle for me to grow up in the 70s, not even a hundred years past when people were still living their indigenous lifestyle, um, had lost so much in such a short amount of time, you know, almost within a whole, just within one lifetime. And, you know, there was so much that they should have been passing down. Um, even if like this kind of work that I'm doing now, if, my, if this could have been happening in my parents' generation, if it could have been started in the 50s and 60s, there would have been a lot more elders to talk to to help save a lot of this knowledge that's out there. Instead of you know, teaching you know, kids how to do things like sewing and carpentry and house cleaning and things like this, right? Um, and again, like being really harsh and almost a strict regiment way of lifestyle. So these were really harsh ways for these kids to live in. You know, uh, this is such a powerful photo with these really tiny handcuffs that were built specifically for these young indigenous kids, you know. Um, and so many of them didn't even survive. So we were just at the, at the Carlisle Indian School, which was the very first model that happened. And to look at all the graves of all these kids, and some of them aren't even labeled because they don't know what they are. And they moved all the graves from one big area to one small area because they thought the graveyard took up too much space. And they wanted to, because right now that boarding school is a war college. They teach, you know, military actions and things there. Um, so we just look at um, how destructive this was for family. And this is a photo of the boarding school on Pine Ridge. And the families of these young children camped out just close to it, just so they could see their kids, because they weren't even allowed to, like, go and visit with them, you know, for long periods of time. Um, so just a really tough time. So it is that, and it was not only like losing the culture at a really high rate, but just losing all the land and falling into the system of oppression and seeing things like the Homestead Act open up and seeing things like um, the Dawes Act and all these pieces that just gave away all of this indigenous owned land like, you know, like nothing. Um, and it was really, these are crimes against humanity when you start to read about all of these bad things that were happening with all of this stuff. So to understand like how we got to where we are today, like why aren't Native American restaurants normalized? Why aren't they everywhere? Why hasn't America culturally appropriated them yet? Because they're so good at that with everything else, you know? <laughs> the reason is all of those pieces, you know, combined, because it's a very short history that we've just been through. 
um, and it's going to take some healing. So it's important to have these conversations. It's important to learn about the hardships of both perspectives of settlers, immigrant settlers coming in and the indigenous peoples who are just trying to hold on to their way of life and their lifestyles as long as they could. So for me, growing up in post-colonial Native America, less than 100 years after the Lakota have gone from traditional to being uh, you know, on a reservation still, and being like one of the poorest reservations in all of the United States, if not the most, um, it's, it was tough, because people will always say, like, what did you eat growing up? You know, because they want to hear the fun stories, like, oh, we got up early, you know, I took down an elk with a slingshot I made myself. <laughs> And we made a big feast for everybody. It was awesome. We gathered a bunch of roots and onions, and it was super cool. But no, I grew up with the commodity food system, you know, because we were still living in an oppressed time period. We had been removed from our food systems. The bison were gone. You know, the um, we weren't growing up on Pine Ridge. It's a it's, it's deserty. Um, it's a it's a tough area. You can't do much. It's really sandy, thorny soil. You know. Um, so this is what this is what my pantry looked like growing up, and this is so. If you understand what the commodity food program is, the commodity food program started in the 20s um, to help all of these immigrant farmers that had been placed all over the West, so the government could start creating surplus out of these out of what they were growing. So and then they started processing these, these foods, and you, you know they're being overprocessed, especially they've always been overprocessed, but large amounts of fats, salts, um, preservatives, all sorts of stuff like this, and it's just super overprocessed food. So people growing up on this diet can survive, but it actually creates a lot of health problems. Because the problem with this program is it's never been a nutritional program. It was never designed to make people healthy. It was only designed to, for the U.S. government to have that surplus. So there, you see these kinds of foods in hospitals, you see them in school systems, and you see them in Native American um, communities. So uh, we see a lot of issues with this, and we see things like this, like a lot of people think about Indian tacos or fry bread tacos as something that is, uh, that is the Native American food. But this actually doesn't have anything to do with us because this is born from uh, the commodity food program. You know, this is born from getting uh, staples like flour, lard, salt, sugar, and it doesn't have anything, and it shouldn't represent every single indigenous community out there, you know? So it's really um, important to rethink what we think about n indigenous foods and the land that we're standing on. So to understand an indigenous food system, just think about how diverse we are. Think about how much awesome diversity we have just in our, in, on, on all of this, bi on a biological scale, right? We've got mountains, we've got tundras, we've got arctic areas, we've got great plains, we've got the coastal regions, we've got deserts, we've got all sorts of stuff. In each of these diverse regions, there's all sorts of different animals and plants that thrive within those different areas. And to think about people, think about indigenous peoples on a language scale. So if you look at a language map of indigenous languages, you can see how diverse it is, right? You can see that you know every hundred miles it's a different language, it's that which would be a different culture, a different religion, you know, different traditions, all sorts of different stuff. And it's not homogenous at all. It's like this awesome vast area. And we look at the diversity from Mexico all the way up through Alaska, and there's so much to learn there. Because um, Mexico is amazingly diverse, um, the, the, what is the U.S. and Canada, and for us we don't really care about which side speaks Spanish, which side, which side speaks English, which side speaks uh, kind of a weird French a little bit, and it's just like a, you know, it's just a really, those are all colonial languages, we just look at all this diversity of the indigenous languages that are there. There's so much to think about. There's so many different groups out there, and these are generalized even. There's a lot of groups within those, within those regions. So we should be thinking about all of this regional historical diversity that we have all across North America. Um, and we're lucky that we have things like this. So this is a map of all of the Dakota waterway names of everywhere around us. You know, It's important that we even have any of that knowledge left today. To be able to like say like these are the original names of these original waterways of this lake of this river of this hill you know so because we've lost a lot of that information we renamed everything and we don't even realize that we're using a lot of dakota names in so many of our pieces right um so there's still 634 tribes in canada there's 573 in the u.s uh, mexico a third of the whole population still speaks an indigenous language which is a huge population right there's a lot of indigenous diversity alive today in North America, as there are in many parts of the world. Um, so we look at, um, when we're looking at the food systems, we're not just looking at 
you know, how to cut up a carrot um, in, in a bunch of different shapes and all the different French names you would give that. You're not looking at all the 20 ways of cooking an egg, a chicken egg, and, and thinking about that. We have to think about food was thought about differently because, again, uh, food wasn't something that had a price tag on it. Food was something that everybody worked together really hard for because it was dependent uh, for their whole community to work together for food. It's the center of everything. When we started doing research with the History Center here in St. Paul, we realized that every single piece had to do with food, you know, because everybody's job is food. You're hunting, you're gathering, you're fishing, you're doing wild rice, you're making maple, you're making artwork that's reflective of the food, you're telling stories, you've got prayers, you've got songs, everything else around it. So food was a complicated situation. It wasn't just something that we take for granted. It was something that everybody worked hard. So we had to look at all those pieces. For us, when we're researching foods, we're looking at the wild foods, the permaculture, the native agriculture, the seed saving, the seasonal lifestyles, ethno-oceanography, hunting, fishing, butchery, salt, sugar, fat production, land stewardship, cooking techniques, regional histories, traditional medicines, food preservation, fermentation, nutrition, health. That's a lot of pieces to apply to what's going into your food system. Um, so for us, the biggest piece that helped us reconnect with our ancestors was the plant knowledge. It was just going outside, you know, it was us uh, stopping to you stop you know, so we were not using the term we because that's a lazy term. It just means you don't know what the plant is. You know, you need to go out there and learn the names of things, right? I like to tease that our kids can name off more Kardashians than they can tree species, right? And that's our fault. We should be teaching them really important uh, lessons that are that apply. Like all of these plants outside have a purpose, you know, because indigenous communities knew that um, everything out there had a purpose. Everything, except for tips. Everything else had a purpose, you know? So because, uh, because of that, we just started really researching and looking at it, discovering how much beautiful flavor and health is all around us constantly. You know, this is walking around North Dakota Plains for just a little bit, when people might just see a vast expanse of nothingness, and there's actually so much beautiful diversity, and it happens anywhere you are. We started seeing all sorts of different flavors. There's sours, like the sumac, um, you know, there's things that people wouldn't know how to use, like choke cherries, which is something Lakota people grew up with, a lot of indigenous peoples grew up with, that makes really wonderful flavorings that, you know, if you eat it off the, off the tree, it doesn't taste like much. Um, we were looking at uh, understanding the spring foods and understanding the seasonal lifestyles of things, like with these spruce tips and these ramp tips, um, and just like understanding that mushrooms, of course, are not a plant, but, uh, you know, living out there in the wild, and it's a whole different world of uh, things out there. There's so many different pieces that people are utilizing. Understanding how staples work. Like this is a picture of Timsala, which is common in Lakota homes. It's a wild prairie turnip, and it grows all over out there. It used to grow a lot more, but we've destroyed a lot of its natural habitat with monoculture farms and things like that. But it's a really wonderful thing. Or the camas roots of the Pacific Northwest. There's so much beautiful staples out there of all these tubers growing in the wild. Or where we are, where we're lucky that we have this beautiful wild rice that grows in such a small, unique area of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and a little bit of Canada. It used to grow all the way out into New York, but we've destroyed so many of its natural ways. And we're seeing it receding northward because of all the warmer temperatures that are happening over this past you know, couple of decades. Um, because, you know, staples like this, and the reason why we see a lot of um, people within our indigenous communities trying to stand up for natural and, resor and resor natural resource rights and understanding why it's important to keep these waterways clean because these are food, these are ancient food sources, you know, and these are, it is important to think about, you know, holding on to a lot of what we have because we've lost so much. You know, wild rice was common way down here in the cities area. We, you know, you barely see it growing anywhere anymore because we've clear cut so many areas. We've dumped so many weird chemicals and things. There's been so much weird runoff and stuff. So we should be thinking about the future. We should be thinking about, we have the ability to grow as much food as we, as we can. You know, we should be thinking about permaculture and just putting food everywhere we possibly can. You don't need five acre lawns. Like, the lawns are stupid. You should be building food everywhere you possibly can put food plants down, right? So, um, and it's been making families happy and thriving for a long time. So understanding all these things are like the coastal regions. It's exciting to think about people that lived on the coast and all the plants that they had um, and how people have been processing that for so long. Or the deserts where all the plants look like they want to kill you or maim you or hurt you in some fashion, but the indigenous peoples knew how to live with them, you know? There's so much beauty in that. And that, and again, it's indigenous education of how to live with these plants in harmony and how to sustain an entire community off of what's right around you. 
Um, when we look at North American indigenous agriculture, because we live in an indigenous agricultural zone area where people have been growing here for a long time, you know, and they see um, it happening way back down at the bottom of Mexico. But, you know, we think of agriculture in different terms today. We think of uh, these big corporate industry driven monoculture systems that are out there that we know is not good for the soil. We know there's all sorts of issues, but we also know we have to feed a lot of people. But that's not, that's not the only solution. There's other ways to think about food. And when we think about indigenous agriculture, a lot of people might know about a three sisters system where you grow corn and you put the beans around it and the beans will crawl up the corn stalk and then the squash you put around the bottom and it helps cover all of the area below to keep other weeds and things like that. And it's like this be beautiful combination of plants that grow together. And this is a really typical style of East Coast farmers because again, so much indigenous diversity out there, this was not the only way people were doing things. People saw in Mexico City, uh, where it is today, that they had these floating gardens, you know, but they were actually raised bed gardens out of the, out of the lake bed that they built the whole city on. And it was a beautiful agricultural system that helped um, regenerate the soil constantly every year because all these nutrients in the water and the fish, because they kept the water so clean. There was just so much, they were able to reap so much out of the same area um, constantly. Um, or in the middle of the desert where eventually after, you know, quite a few generations of seed selection, they're able to grow up corns and beans and squash and sunflowers and amaranth and chilies that are heat resistant and drought resistant and can thrive in those hot desert areas, right? And you're seeing those same things in the ag indigenous agriculture, corns, beans, squash, amaranth, sunflowers, and chilies. You see it all the way up into North Dakota. This woman's name is Buffalo Bird Woman. And she um, is growing the same kinds of thing. And there's a really beautiful book out there called Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden. And if you're interested in native agriculture, you should read that book because it's a really unique perspective uh, of indigenous agriculture. And it's a really rare female voice that comes through history when you never see those indigenous female voices come through. There's so many lessons, which is all the lessons that she had from her grandmother and their grandmother before them, all that knowledge coming down as farmers. Um, so we're lucky we have any of the sea diversity because just like the peoples and communities, we lost a lot of this indigenous um, life that's out there through these seas. Um, so there's so much beauty out there today and we work really hard looking for these seeds and working with farmers and growers and making sure that um, people are seeing the true value of some of these seeds that have been around in some of these areas for, you know, thousands of generations, for hundreds of years, you know, for a long, long time. Um, we look at, you know, so you see beans, you see squash diversity, um, we look at how people are processing things, we see the nixtamalization process of corn, or turning corn into hominy or consoli, depending on how you might know it. But something as simple as adding wood ash to water, which creates an alkaline base, which processes the corn differently, but it makes it more soluble for your body, so you get high uh, minerals like calcium, potassium, magnesium, iron, zinc. You know, that's why people were living so healthy off of these kinds of things. You see, um, if you look at Mexico, Mexico is a better um, indication of what is indigenous food than it is Spanish or French. It's more indigenous because you've got the nixtamalized corns, like the, like the masa harina and the tamales and the tortillas, all this nixtamalized corn product. You have beans, you have chilies. You know, there's this, uh, this uh, um, uh, exhibit in here that shows the Mayan or the Mex Aztec market, you know, and you see all those pieces right there, right? Um, you think about food preservation, you think about how resourceful people had to be because you had to be on top of it right away, you couldn't let things go to waste. So something as simple as dehydrating food is so effective, right? Think about if one grocery store took the time to dehydrate food instead of throwing it away because it looks weird, it's got a little piece of mold on it or something, but just, just dehydrated everything before it went bad, how much food stock we would have. We have all these hunger issues, even in our own cities. You know, and we could be like one, one single grocery store can make a huge difference just by doing things differently. Um, and saving seeds, like as chefs, like we make sure that we save all these seeds to go back to the farmers. So for us, it was looking at this all differently, looking at North American cuisine completely differently. So we knew the U.S. should not be identified by just hamburgers and Coca-Cola across the whole board, and Canada should not just be poutine all the way across the board. <laughs> Tacos are cool, though. Tacos are totally cool. Um, so, but looking at, you know, starting a group of young chefs that were working with us, getting them out to be a part of this every year, um, understanding, reconnecting with nature, with plants, seeing food everywhere we looked, you know, uh, making our own pantries of things that taste exactly like where we are, um, and just having fun with it, you know, putting artistry on the plates, making food taste like uh, where things are. So this is rabbit, cedar, wild rice, cranberry, maple. You can see all those ingredients just standing in one spot somewhere in Minnesota. It's all around you. 
Um, so there's so much we can do with just food that was right near us, you know, and keeping it simple and creating businesses out of it um, and getting out there to native communities and bringing this back and making and hearing the stories from the elders who haven't even had some of these food for so long and all this outpouring of, of emotion and uh, ancestral memories coming out of them because they hadn't tasted these flavors for such a long time. Like, oh, I remember my grandmother used to have this. We used to go out in the forest, we used to pick this. You know, there's so much, uh, so much story out there. So for us, that's why we've created um, something that we're trying to do everywhere. We didn't want to just open up one restaurant because that would have worked, just put us in a box. And restaurants are actually one of the worst business plans too because you struggle really hard, you're hurting drunk cats constantly with your own staff, and you're, you know, you're, you're dealing with all sorts of costs, there's all sorts of stuff going on with restaurants, and you know, you maybe make like a two to three percent net at the very end of the year after all those hours of hard work, you know. It's really hard, but they can also be really important. So we wanted to be able to do this because we knew restaurants can change the way a whole community thinks about food, right? Um, so we created Natives, or North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems, with two focuses, indigenous education and creating food access, which is kind of the two points that we saw colonialism hitting against us, is taking away our food and taking away our knowledge. So we're doing something that's going to give those two things back. So we created the Indigenous Food Lab, which is a model we're hoping to open as early as spring this next year, which is a 501c3 nonprofit restaurant designed to help bring back this education, to have a classroom kitchen, and to have a live, open to the public restaurant that we can use as a training ground, because on-the-job training is so important and valuable. Um, and it's got all that pieces. It's going to allow us to do research and development. Um, and we're hoping to, well, we're going to be opening right here in the cities as early as spring, and our goal is to become a resource to create all this curriculum around um, the complexity of indigenous foods. Um, create, utilizing things like this cookbook that's just out. Um, it has over 100 recipes using only indigenous pieces, you know. We cut out all colonial ingredients. There's no dairy, wheat flour, no processed sugar. We didn't even use beef, pork, or chicken because all those things didn't exist here not that long ago. We just proved the point that we can do it still today. And then we want to work with the tribes around us, help them to develop their own healthy indigenous um, entity of some kind, a catering company to a restaurant, whatever they can manage, but utilizing ourselves as all the training the ground for that. And then we want to get the kids used to seeing community gardens and land and permaculture design and hopefully seeing more indigenous food vendors come out of there because we want to purchase from them. We want to support them and, and, and help develop that economy. Um, and then we want to open up indigenous food labs in cities all over North America and be a role model for the rest of the world of how we can reclaim all of this indigenous knowledge that sits no matter where you're standing, right? Um, so there's so much we can do. So for us, this is an indigenous evolution and a revolution all at the same time. So I know we're getting close and we wanted to do a couple of questions, so I'm going to end right there. So I know there's a lot of information in a very short time, but um, thanks. <laughs> squeeze in a, a book signing back here around the corner and then our sous chef catering team is around that way and they have some snacks and there's some hot cedar maple tea which are the only two ingredients um, so there'll be a few things you can do but for now if there are a couple of questions we'd be happy to address that so we have about 10 minutes for questions Chris? Oh, we've, we've found a lot because you think about, um, he's asking, uh, is it hard to find a wide range of ingredients to play with? Um, and we've been looking at um, just utilizing regional indigenous foods no matter where we are. Because we're not even fusionizing with the other indigenous cultures, you know, like when we opened up our food truck to Tonka truck, we were just using foods from this region. Um, so there's a lot because you're looking at all of that knowledge of plant diversity that's around you and all of those plant diversity that's used for food. So if you think about it, a lot of people survive off of uh, 20 or less plant species. Because you go to the store, you buy the same stuff. You get your onion, your tomato, your potato, your lettuce, your apples, you know, and you can almost stop counting by the, 20, by the time you even hit 20. And that's it. But for indigenous peoples, they had to be resourceful. They had to utilize everything around you. Um, and it's fun. You know, it's fun to go outside and to start to harvest this. And we found that a lot of these pieces, pieces are just growing naturally right around us constantly. They're all over the place. So working with some of these native farms that are close by uh, here, we use Dreamwell Health, um, which is in Hugo, Minnesota. Um, we use Wojuki Gardens, which is part of the Midwakanen down around Prior Lake Shakopee. 
Um, there's a local one in town called Mashkiki, that's a small community garden too. But even on the outskirts, there was all this fringe of all these beautiful flavors like wild bergamots and hyssops and wild gingers and you know, utilizing all these trees like the pine and the spruce and the cedar and, and the fir and all this, this, all this flavor all around us. And animals are the easy part because protein, anybody can break down an animal, you know. And we played with all sorts of different, because all the animals are literally a game, right? But it's really, that wasn't the focal point. Our focal point was how much beautiful plant life we have around us. And the agricultural piece on top of it, there's, there's so much history there. There's so much beautiful stuff. There's all these different kinds of corns, and all these different ways you can manipulate corns. You can have fresh corn, you can have green corn, you can have dry ground corn, you can have boiled and then dried corn, you can have mixed corn, you can dry out the mixed corn, and you have masa harina to make tamales and tortillas. There's all these ways to do that. We started looking at food in all sorts of different ways. We're looking at all the different ways we can process wild rice. We're looking at uh, processing squash. You know, most people wouldn't even know what to do with squash flour, but we, you know, we're just curious chefs and we just like to play with it. So we didn't have to use just traditional recipes. We just wanted to redevelop the entire pantry because we knew our ancestors of indigenous communities had large pantries of all sorts of cool flavorings. And we wanted to see if we can replicate that and then start playing with the foods moving forward. Any other questions? We'll wait for the microphone so everybody can hear. We'll take this one first. <coughs> Thank you for opening our eyes oh, to, um, to the indigenous perspective on foods. And, and I, I have a question about uh, the plants and animals that have arrived here. Um, they are newcomers, but they become naturalized. They, many of them have escaped from cultivation and they've been living on the land now for uh, many generations. Uh, how do you feel about incorporating those uh, new neighbors in, in, uh, in indigenous uh, cooking? That was a, a big part of what we did because we do live in uh, not only a melting pot of people and culture, but also animals and plant life and things are completely different. And so we weren't trying to do a timepiece. We weren't trying to cook exactly like it was 1491. We were just trying to utilize that knowledge and that perspective. So again, like we're looking at plants, um, even if, so we're using dandelion, we're using purslane, we're using all these plant species that were not from here particularly, um, but we're just looking at it from an indigenous perspective. So if they're here now, they're thriving, um, what is it? Is it food? Is it medicine? Is it can you can do something like create paints or um, crafts with it or something? And usually, usually it's all of the above that you can use these plants. So we just try to use that perspective of understanding that there's multiple um, things you can do with all these pieces out there um, and not being afraid to implement them and not drawing a hard line because in history this wouldn't have been here or this and that. But plants we love, vegetables we love, we think everybody should eat a ton of them. And there's a whole bunch of them out there and we should implement whatever's around us to make it taste like where we are. You know, there's a lot we can play with out there. All right. I know there's some more out there. A couple of things. Where will, where will the restaurant be? Um, so, uh, so for the Indigenous Food Lab, we are we've been working with a broker this last year because we just got our 501c3 in January. So it's a brand new entity. Um, so we have two potential hopefuls. Both uh, one of them is in Northeast and one of them is in South Minneapolis. And as soon as we're able to close on one of these uh, projects uh, uh, properties, then we'll do a big public push and let people know exactly where it's at. Um, we also have a waterworks project, which is with the Minneapolis Park Board, which is a restaurant where they're, um, it's, in, it's the old Fujita building that's right on the riverfront downtown Minneapolis, and it's right next to where the Stone Arch Bridge comes in on downtown. So the Park Board and the Park Board Foundation are redoing that entire front and creating a brand new green space along that whole way, and they're rebuilding these uh, old buildings using some of the, um, some of the old brickwork and things from the old buildings, the old footprints that still live there. Um, so we're going to have a, we're the vendor that's selected to be there, but that project won't be ready till 2020. But uh, we're looking forward to being that vendor to give that story of that particular area, which has a lot of really special Dakota meanings right there and a lot of history right there too. Are you also going to be incorporating things like bison and moose and deer? Yeah, so we do already use a, a lot of bison. Um, if people went to our sous chef website and looked up our catering menu, you can see a lot of the typical things that we sell in public. So we've had the catering uh, operation open for four years now. Um, and again, like uh, we haven't done a single piece of fry bread, but we also haven't 
You know, we don't do any um, wheat flour or processed sugar or dairy uh, or beef, pork, and chicken. And again, it was just to prove a point that we could do it. So we use a lot of bison, a lot of rabbit, a lot of venison. We have used uh, different species like muskrat and moose, um, elk, things like that. Um, we use a lot of uh, birds. So there's duck, there's geese, there's quail. There's, uh, we use a lot of all the, all the lake fish. Um, we try to purchase from indigenous vendors first, so we're lucky that we have the Red Lake Reservation, who has a huge, awesome fishery, so we're able to get things like um, walleye and northerns and whitefish all coming out of that freshwater lake up there. It's just so, it's such a beautiful pro product. But we want to hopefully see more and more indigenous food producers out there so we can help spur some of that much needed economy out there, too. Yeah, we, she's asking if we're well received within the indigenous communities, and we feel like we really have been. We feel like we've been very welcome. We get a lot of asks, and I'm uh, going around doing a lot of these presentations, and a lot of these talks, and a lot of these dinners, and a lot of these demonstrations. And that was part of the reason that we're doing what we wanted to do, because we didn't want to just open up one restaurant that would uh, impact our region, but we wanted to, like, how can we get this out there everywhere? We kind of use my own skills of restaurants and understanding how franchises work, of how like how kind of like a five guys and whatever open up 200 restaurants in a very short time period. And like, could we do that for good? You know, um, so we wanted to we wanted to utilize a very similar situation and make that happen all over. So this is why we see this nonprofit situation being really impactful out there. Um, and indigenous communities everywhere are really excited to the potential to work with us down the road, helping them to implement very similar uh, things of what we're doing into their own communities. Um, and again, like because restaurants are so uh, rough when it comes to business and such a poor choice in business models, um, you might as well call them a nonprofit from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if there's any intersection between the between Indian foods and the casinos. Um, down the road, because the casinos have um, created a lot of financial support um, for their communities. A lot of the casinos um, were kind of, uh, there's a lot of different situations out there. So some casinos are basically a big debt that the tribe had bought into to have a big casino built and they, the community rarely sees any of the profits come out of it. Um, so there's, but we really feel like um, they do have the ability to be able to uh, feature something that is very much their own, right? And we're hoping that we can help influence them more and more. So we do see some of that influence happening here and there, um, and if we feel like as we start to help develop more and more um, indigenous food businesses and models, that we should start seeing them more and more, because there are a lot of uh, wonderful native chefs starting to appear. There's this big movement that we feel because we're in the mix of it, and it's not just us, and it's not just about me, there's a whole bunch of players, because there's seed keepers and farmers and chefs and academics, um, craft people, there's all sorts of wonderful people working together. And we've been having these big groups come together a few times a year to celebrate this in different parts of the country. And it's amazing to see all of this healthy, positive um, uh, energy coming out of uh, what is this movement that's kind of boiling up. And we're seeing it all over the place because we travel internationally. So we're seeing it um, starting to happen in Africa. We're seeing it in parts of India. We're seeing it in parts of uh, New Zealand, um, Hawaii, South America. And we're hoping that we can just continue to do the work that we do so we can hopefully be role models to help showcase, you know, our perspective of what we think we can do to be impactful. What can the non-native community do to be helpful? Uh, what can the non-native community do to be helpful? Well, we, um, you know, we hope to see more and more indigenous vendors out there. We hope that people support and buy a lot of these beautiful products. And I know I see a lot of Winona LaDuke's products in the, um, in the co-ops and things like that. So, the, um, so, and we're, you know, as a nonprofit, we are always looking for more support as we're growing to help us see this vision through. Um, and because we're an open to the public uh, restaurant, sorry, that we're um, just excited to be able to have all sorts of people come through, try the food, and to make this indigenous food something that's normal for everybody. You know, and to think about history and the land of standing on no matter where you are, whether you're in Mexico or whether you're way up in Alaska or you're in Ohio, you know, it doesn't matter 
where you might be. There's history and there's food there. So it's just being open to this history that's happened there, understanding the hardships, understanding why it's important to talk about things like genocide, because those things did, did happen. And the last phase of genocide is always denial. It's always for the, the winning group that does the genocide to have that strong sense of denial, to pretend like, well, that's something our ancestors did. We, didn't, we don't have to deal with it, but we all have to deal with it. It's all of our histories. We all have to move forward, and we have to understand that there is so much important wisdom out there within the indigenous communities all around the world, and those are uh, knowledges that can be important and useful and resourceful for all of us to look at food and, and natural resources and land um, differently, completely. All right, that's our time. I think we're probably about there, huh? Great, well, thank you.